Okay, welcome to uh, the final uh, Tips to the Trade webinars that are brought to you by West Marine Pro. Today we have Steve Teresi, who is Director mm -hmm. of Training and Technical Services for Dale Audio, and he will be speaking about amplifier configuration. Uh, if you could, uh, at the bottom of your screen, you will see both a Q&A and a chat. Um, both of those are available to you if you have questions as we go through the presentation. At the end of the presentation, we'll answer all of the questions. And you'll also see contact information for Steve if you have additional questions that you'd like to ask him. In the meanwhile, enjoy the presentation and I'm going to hand it over to Steve. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And thank you everyone for joining in today. And a special thanks to West Marine Pro for giving us this opportunity. So I uh, have with me two uh, co-presenters, Kevin and Rob, that'll be jumping in for any times that I may go a little off the rails. Uh, as you'll see, I get very excited about uh, the content that I'm sharing. It uh, comes from a passion and a love for what, for what we do. Just a brief moment about me. I've been affiliated with JL Audio for nearly 30 years now. So I guess I'm one of the older guys there, um, but I just wanted to give you an idea of who I was to the company. So if you had questions about our history or anything like that, I'd be happy to answer those as we get to the end. But today our session is about um, configuring amplifiers and setting them up and doing this all for performance and reliability. So we're gonna get into some basic terms in audio, talk about a little bit of electrical stuff, some speakers and system layout information. We'll talk about installation considerations. And of course, we'll talk about what can go wrong with speakers and electrical issues. And then finally, we'll get to the point of, uh, of the matter, which would be the setup of the system. And then I'll ask for a couple of moments to give a shameless plug for JL Audio and our products. So without further ado, let's jump into some basic audio terms. Now, as you might imagine, there's a ton of different terms in audio, but really for the conversation we'll have today, we're only gonna focus on two of those terms. And we're gonna start off with the first one, which is frequency, which is quite literally how often something happens. In audio, we look for the number of cycles per second. That's what we're looking for. And if we have a waveform that looks like this one, over this period of time, whatever time that is, the number of ups, and downs that that waveform completes in that period of time is gonna be known as its frequency. If you look at this waveform, you can see it's going up and down more often in the same period of time. So we could say that that has a higher frequency compared to the lower frequency. And we measure all this in Hertz. So that is basic concept of frequency. Moving on to amplitude. Amplitude basically means level. And if you look at those same, the same two waveforms, how tall they are, how big they are, is called the amplitude. And if we make them bigger, we're increasing the amplitude. Can you imagine what an amp will do? So obviously we'll talk about what the amplifier does and how to get performance of it. And all of this is just background information so you understand some of the terminology that we'll use. And we've been showing these little drawings that um, are basically their sine waves, which really just means a steady tone at a particular frequency. And what it really looks like when you analyze it looks more like this. So we've been trying to draw that just because it's easy to look at. And it's a lot easier to look at waveforms like these as opposed to musical signals, which as you can tell from these images at lower and higher amplitude, it's very jagged and very difficult to see any differences in one waveform to the next. So sine waves tend to be used for analysis because it just makes things easier to look at. But know that all the terms and everything we're talking about does apply to music, which is, of course, what we all really care about. No one really likes listening to sine waves. Well, maybe Rob. Rob might. But most people don't. <laughs> okay. So as we get into some basic electrical terms, we're going to cover all of these. And there are other terms in electricity, but the main ones that we really focus on are the big three, the voltage, the current, and the resistance. And this is going to form the vast majority, uh, the basis of the vast majority of things that you'll ever deal with with electricity. In fact, there's a law that, is, uh, that corresponds to the relationship of all of these terms known as Ohm's law. Don't worry, I hear you groaning from here. We're not gonna cover Ohm's law. We're not gonna get into that. But we will talk about the general relationship of these three parameters as we get into it. Then we'll talk about some other little tidbits. Starting off with voltage, which is basically the potential for something to happen. And if you look at the example of the battery, without the wires coming from the battery, nothing happens. Batteries are just a paperweight at that point. You need to connect something to it before something actually happens. And if you take a look at this analogy with a bucket, Voltage is like the water inside the bucket. There's a potential for something to get wet, but you need to take some action in order for that to happen. With the uh, battery, it's gonna be the wires. With the bucket, it's gonna be the hose to, to make things work. I also found this really cool representation, this little drawing here. 
Um, of course, you troll the internet, you find all kinds of cool stuff like this. Um, voltage is the guy over there on the left there that's trying to push the other guy through what's known as a pinch point there, that tightening uh, of the rope there. Now, he may be able to push him through, but if the pinch gets really, really tight, or maybe he's not that strong and he can't push him through, nothing's going to happen. Current is when things happen. Another analogy I have, and I didn't draw an image, and you'll be thankful <laughs> that I didn't. Uh, imagine if you went to a fast food place and you got a coffee stir, those little plastic things that are really kind of like a, a thin little straw, and you tried to drink a milkshake through that straw. That gives you an idea of the relationship of potential resistance and current flow. The straw is too narrow, the resistance is too high for the voltage to be able to push, uh, sorry, for the uh, um, shake to get through the straw. So these analogies all work as a, a way of representing this, but the water one seems to work the best. We're gonna use all three, the guys, the water, and the battery as we go forward. All right, next up we have current, which is the motion of the electrons through a circuit. This is the flow. In reality, this is how things get done in electricity. No current, no work. Something's got to move before anything gets done. With the water analogy, the hole in the side of the bucket with a hose is how the water is going to flow through. Now, remembering Mr. Amp. Mr. Amp's the guy in the middle. He's the one doing the movement. He's the one going somewhere. He's the one getting it done. Keep that in mind as we keep going forward. Next up, we have resistance. Now, one could make a case that resistance and the management of resistance is the most important part of electricity. And if we look at that bucket analogy, the hose is gonna have some kind of resistance. And if you think about it, a larger diameter hose is gonna have less resistance and allow more water to flow through faster. Alternatively, if the hose was a mile long, that additional length is gonna cause a lot of resistance as well, and that would ultimately reduce the flow. Now, what if we blew a hole in the side of the bucket? Gigantic hole. Well, obviously, a whole lot of work would get done, but then there'd be no more water. You would deplete that voltage, uh, sorry, the water in the bucket. The voltage source would go away. Obviously, you need some kind of resistance to control all of that. And if you remember these guys, Mr. Ohm up there, he's pulling up on that, that pinch point. He's making it harder for the voltage to, uh, how do we say this, motivate Mr. Amp to get through that little tight point there. This will cause some stress, and that stress shows up in the form of heat. Now, heat is actually necessary to get things done. Too much heat, that's bad. We don't want too much heat. So management of the heat and the whole relationship of all this is what's most important. Now I'm gonna put something up that's just a clarification. Normally we measure resistance in ohms for DC circuits. In AC circuits, which is what most music is, it's actually a little bit more complicated and it's known as impedance. But for our conversation today, just to make it simple, we're gonna use resistance interchangeably with impedance. I just wanted to acknowledge that that's not technically correct, but for general conversation, it works just fine. Let's keep moving. So that's electricity. Now let's talk about speakers. So we, we covered the electronics part of it. Now we'll show what happens with the speaker. Amps connect to speakers, so it's gonna be helpful to know how they actually work to understand what could go wrong. On the back end of a speaker, you're gonna have a magnet of some sort. And this acts as what's known as a stable or a stationary force for the speaker, to, the voice coil to push off of. So let's talk about the voice coil. The voice coil is a, an interesting property in electricity that if you run electricity through a coil of wire, it creates a very tight magnetic field. We use that magnetic field to push off the magnet in the back to make motion. And we connect something to the, the voice coil called the cone, and the cone will move with the voice coil to uh, pressurize the air, pressurize and depressurize the air. And all of this is held together with things known as suspension. The suspension of the speaker, you can see that little yellowish, orangey kind of thing that's known as a spider. It uh, is usually at the center of the speaker to help not only control how far out and far in the speaker moves, but also centers it so that it stays in the middle of the magnetic gap around the speaker's uh, cone itself is something that's called a surround. Logical name, it surrounds the cone, they call it a surround. These uh, two parts make up the suspension and it helps control what's known as the excursion of the speaker, how far it moves out and how far it moves in. Something interesting about this is if you're listening to a speaker and you hear it making some strange noises, if you hear it making a, the sound like, let's say your shirt, if you flap your shirt, that would be the suspension kind of stretching out and making um, a flapping noise. That's an indication that the speaker's moving too far. We'll come back to that a little bit later on, but just mentally keep that in mind that excursion is controlled by the surround and the spider or the suspension of the speaker. Okay. 
Now that we have the basics of electronics and speakers, we're going to talk about basic system concepts. Now, in general, you're going to have a bunch of different ways of getting audio into any given system, things like a USB drive, you might have um, a Bluetooth connection, you might have a radio, you might have your cell phone. All these devices will have audio associated with them, and you need to send them into your audio system. And this is usually done by either Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Um, there's RCA connections or those standard aux cables that you can plug into a source unit like we show here, control unit or a source unit. Now these source units will often have a small amplifier built in and as a result, they'll need power from the uh, vessel's electrical system. Now technically, some of the other devices will need power as well, but normally your phone's got a battery in it and you only have to plug it in to charge it up. The USB is gonna get its power from the source unit itself when you plug it in and so on. But in terms of real power from the system, it's gonna come in the, uh, the source unit in this example. Now that, that amplifier that's built in is not very powerful, but it is strong enough to take the small signal from the musical sources and make them bigger signals and carry that by speaker wires into the full range speakers that'll be on your boat. That's a very basic system. So if you look at the speaker over my head here, that's what we're showing here, the standard normal speaker. All right. A typical system, like the one that you would consider adding an amplifier to, is going to have a source unit that, again, is going to need some kind of power from the, from the vessel. And that is going to take a small signal and send it out to that external amplifier, and we use RCA connections to make that connection. That external amplifier is also going to need power from the vessel. And the more powerful the amplifier, the more power it's going to need from the vessel. That current demand, which we'll talk about later, becomes important. What the job of the amplifier is, is much like the built-in amplifier, it's to take the small signal and make it bigger. Now, technically, it's doing the same thing, but it's doing it better. There's more features and more control, and frankly, more power to drive those full-range speakers. So that external amplifier really ups the game in terms of overall performance. Of course, again, you'll need power to deliver that power. An area that a lot of people get confused is in multi-zone audio systems on a boat. I want to demystify that right now. A multi-zone audio system on a boat is really the same thing over and over and over again. If you get the concept of a single zone, like you see here, source unit, small signal power, gets amplified to big signal to the speakers, a zone is just duplicating that again to a second zone. So we're doing the same thing a second time. That's all it is. So if you have two zones, three zones, four zones, it's really the same thing over and over again, all determined by the number of speakers you wanna put in any one of those zones. Now, of course, as you add amplifiers, you'll need more energy from the electrical system to feed those amplifiers. So be careful. And again, we'll cover that in just a moment. If you're doing a system with a subwoofer, I call this a slightly more advanced system. Uh, it's really the same thing as a zone system, but one zone is dedicated just for bass frequency. So if we took this one and we added the subwoofer, we only want lower frequencies, like that different waveform that we're showing here, we only want those lower frequencies to go to the subwoofer. And one thing we can do is we can employ what's known as a high pass filter to get rid of low frequencies from the main speakers so that they don't even have to try to do what a subwoofer does. Subwoofers are the big, heavy, you know, giant speakers that you'll hear that play all the bass tones. So in this application, we'll take higher frequencies, send them to the amplifier and call them high pass speakers. We'll cover more about that when we talk about setting crossovers and filters. Now those low frequencies, they're sent through a separate amplifier made bigger to a dedicated subwoofer. When this is done right, not only does the system sound a whole lot better by having a dedicated subwoofer, but it can be made to be much more reliable. Smaller speakers tend not to like to play uh, low frequencies as well. This way we can get rid of those and make the system sound great and be more reliable. So let's get into some of the installation considerations before we start putting uh, amplifiers on boats. The first and foremost for boats is going to be water. Uh, I like to point out that even if an amplifier claims to be waterproof or any bit of electronics claims to be waterproof, that doesn't mean we should throw it in a bucket of water and think that that's okay. We need to be mindful that water is always going to be detrimental over the long term. I point out here that drip loops are important. Uh, what I mean by that is if you're mounting a piece of electronics where wires are coming out of it, you want to make sure that those wires terminate after a loop downward so that any moisture that comes onto that line drips into a well-drained area instead of into the piece of electronics. This can obviously improve the lifespan. Failure to do so can really shorten the lifespan, even on products that claim to be water resistant or waterproof. Water is not the friend of electronics ever. Okay? Next up is heat. Now, 
a lot of climates where boating is popular are already warm. So we always have to consider that, but there are cases where the climate is not so warm. But remember the devices themselves will generate their own heat. So if you're dealing with a boat down in South Florida and it's an amplifier that's gonna get hot anyway, you got a double whammy. What you wanna do is find a location in the vessel that there is at least some air circulation around the amplifier so that uh, some of that heat can dissipate more effectively. Try to get rid of the heat, everything works out a lot better. When we look at fuel, anywhere where there's fuel lines running, sparks are not your friend. So you gotta be really careful in these areas. Obviously you wanna make sure you're paying attention to any of the ABYC rules or the NMEA um, rules when you're doing any installation for any bit of electronics. This is especially so with a high current device like an amplifier. Make sure you use the proper protection, fuses, circuit breakers, and the like. Impact or um, any shaking of the product can also cause some issues and concern. Now the little icon I have here kind of indicates a banging on the actual product. This is not likely unless you have a hatch door that's flapping around, which again, I don't think you would ever do that. But bear in mind that the waves themselves will have a lot of um, impact onto the product itself. So be careful about that. And you know, the, the ever popular thing of hitting a sandbar at high rate of speed can also cause a pretty significant impact. What we need to do with installation is make sure that we're mounting the product in such a way that it's not going to break free or not going to sustain that uh, impact directly. Another thing that I couldn't really find an image for was access. You need to be able to get to these, these electronics. Um, obviously, if something goes wrong, you need to get to it, but you'll also be setting some of the dials and switches, and you don't want to be killing yourself trying to get up to where the product is. So try to leave a little bit of access for not only troubleshooting, but for system setup as well. And finally, some electrical concerns. Current is gonna be the biggest one that we talk about, but noise is also a factor. With some electronics on a boat, noise is not that critical because you don't ever hear it. It may affect the performance, but as long as it doesn't degrade it too much, you may never notice it. But with audio equipment, it can bleed in and it can come through the speakers and customers and people will not like that. So you need to be mindful of noise related concerns. I can right. interrupt you there real quick, Steve. No, oh, it's cool, um, what's up? One thing our technical support team recommends when setting up a system and a great way to help prevent uh, unwanted noise from coming into the system is to make sure you actually have everything audio related on a dedicated circuit. So you're not sharing the positive power wire with uh, trim tabs or other electronics on the boat. So ideally you would want a dedicated power wire to a distribution block and that would then go to your amplifiers for power, your source unit for power, Bluetooth, anything that is tied to the audio system would have its own power line, and then everything would ground to a dedicated ground block, and then that would have its own dedicated ground. And by taking everything out of the existing circuits in the boat, it'll help prevent any of that unwanted electrical noise uh, coming in potentially. Excellent addition, Rob. Thanks for catching that for me. I appreciate it. All right. so. Now that we have the, the general picture, let's talk about things that can go wrong. We're gonna break this up into the electrical slash physical concerns, and then we'll talk about the speakers and the performance related concerns. So let's start off with what can go wrong electrically and physically. And let me click here, there we go. Fusing is gonna be the biggest thing. Um, amplifiers need power, um, and they need more power than just about anything else on the boat. So we're gonna come back to that again in just a moment. When you're doing this, Make sure that you're using the proper protection um, in terms of a circuit breaker like the one shown here or a fuse. Now the easy thing to do when setting the fuse is to make sure you look in the owner's manual. For those that are unfamiliar, this is a document that comes with the equipment that is often discarded upon opening the box. Please look at that. There's really good information in there from us and everybody else for that matter. There's some good information. At the very least, take a look at the fuse value. That's what's recommended. This is true of all electronics. Make sure you're pro using proper fusing. The reason for the fuse is to prevent something bad from happening. If something goes wrong with the product or the wiring, the fuse will trip and stop electricity from flowing. Because something could happen that's known as a dead short. Dead shorts or low impedance or low resistance uh, on a circuit can cause misbehavior at the very least and some catastrophes and a worst case scenario. So in the little image I have here, I got a little battery that's playing a light bulb. And when everything's working fine, the light lights up and everything's good. But if there's a dead short, the light may not work. So your device might not work. You may not have a fish finder. You may not have an amplifier. You may not have navigation of any sort. 
that could be bad, obviously, but there are some other things that could go potentially wrong if you have a dead short in your vessel. So you want to look out for those things. Uh, those are some of the things that can go wrong. And this is on top of all those other things we've already talked about, the heat, the impact, the water, all of these things are things that can go wrong. I want to take a moment and focus on that current issue for a second. Um, I kind of scared you a little bit about how much current these amplifiers might need. Well, the job of an amplifier is to make something bigger. And the more powerful that amplifier is, the more energy it's gonna to need to do this. So it's basically more power out is gonna need more power in. It's gotta come from somewhere. Amplifiers are really good, but they're not magical. It's just a conversion of energy from the electrical system of the vessel to the audio system's electrical needs. Now, a lot of the devices you may be familiar with, I'll take, for example, some of the lights, the running lights on a boat. You flip that circuit on, you could measure the current draw from those lights, and it's pretty steady. But audio is nothing like that. It's not like a steady sine wave that we were looking at earlier. That's why we showed those. That would be a repeating value. That would be fairly easy to predict. But we're talking about music. And music is very dynamic, and it's constantly changing. So determining the normal current draw of an amplifier playing audio is incredibly difficult. True accurate numbers are almost impossible to predict. Doesn't mean we're not gonna try though. So let's go ahead and come up with some ways of kind of looking at an estimated um, amount of current draw on any given vessel for any amplifier that you trust. And I'll come back to that. What you see on the screen here is a, a way of estimating current draw for an amplifier and it's broken down in per 100 watt increments. So as you look across the numbers from left to right, you'll see that they'll change as they go across. And I'm gonna talk about all of these. First up is the type of amplifier. The most amplifiers that you're ever gonna see in uh, marine audio or mobile audio for that matter is gonna be what's known as a class D amplifier. There are other somewhat less popular uh, amplifiers known as class AB. This is a somewhat older design. Not that it's not bad, but class D offers, as you can see in the numbers, a significant improvement in terms of efficiency. It draws less current for a given amount of output power. That's why they've become so popular. As a side note, they also tend to be smaller, but that's sort of a side benefit, remembering the heat relationship we've already talked about. The next thing I'd like to point out is that subwoofer amplifiers are gonna draw more current than a full range or a high pass amplifier. Speaking again about the nature of subwoofers being more demanding, not only from a speaker side of things, but from electrical demand as well. And you could see that clearly represented in the numbers here. Now, of course, there's also a listener that's involved and listeners can run the gamut from someone that barely turns it up to someone that never turns it down. And we need to be mindful of that. And we'll talk again about that in a moment. All right, so I wanna do a quick example here. We're gonna talk about a 600 watt class D subwoofer amplifier for a normal listener. And if we look up at the chart there, you'll see that that is estimated to draw 3.2 amps per 100 watts of power. In this case, it's 600 watts. So if you do the quick check of the math, you're looking at about 20 amps of current draw from that particular amplifier. Now, this is just a guess, it's an estimation, but we have found these numbers to be pretty accurate. I'm a cautious kind of guy. I'm always going to round up. I'd look at that number of 19.2 and I say that's 20 amps. Better safe than sorry, especially on a boat. Now, if you had a more abusive customer, sorry, and you're looking at that excessive value over there, you can see that the numbers jump. So instead of two and a half to four amps of current, you're looking at anywhere from six to eight for that, that hammer guy that just always plays it loud all the time with bass heavy music. That's okay. We don't really mind that guy, but just know that the demand that that's gonna put on the charging system as well as on the speakers could be quite significant. I simplify this and I say two and a half to 10 amps of current per 100 watts, plan accordingly and go from there. I think that's actually a very important chart to, to really focus on when you're, when you're planning a system because listening to music on a boat is totally different than the car where typically we're listening when the alternator's powering everything. You know, in the marine world, a lot of times when we're listening to music, we're off power. We're at the yeah, sandbar, right. we're at the dock, we're hanging out in the water, and the motor's not running. So now we're relying on, on the batteries. Yeah. So in a perfect world, we'll find out from our customers when we're designing a system or working with them, how they're going to listen to the music, what state's the vessel going to be in, are they heavy-handed? And then you can discuss having either big batteries or, lar or a, a larger bank of batteries, because a, an abusive listener on one battery he could kill that battery really quickly. And CETO is expensive and not, not a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, for us, you know, marine environment, audio, it's all about fun. And we want to make sure we design the electron electrical side of the system 
uh, smart to make sure our customers aren't stranded in the water. So for me, this chart's important and really makes you guys be the experts and ensure your customer doesn't get stuck out there and end up having a poor experience uh, all around. Another excellent addition. It does speak to the value of having battery isolation available to you as well. Have something dedicated for this, kind of like what Rob has been sharing with us. Really good additions, Rob. Thank you for those. All right, so if you're paying attention, you know that big amps are going to pull more power from a charging system on a boat. And that means that more current is also going to make more heat. And that's going to be true of the resistance on the wires, the amplifiers themselves, the speakers. So more current, more heat. Bigger voltage drops, you know, the water leaves the bucket faster. Um, thicker wires can help reduce all of this. So when in doubt, go with a bigger wire. That's it. It's the rule of thumb right there. All right. When we get to speakers in terms of performance, let's talk about what can go wrong. We're going to look at a couple of different aspects. We're going to look at the filters and the excursion of the driver. We're going to look at levels and something known as clipping. Most amplifiers you're going to find are going to have some type of filter. They sometimes call them a crossover. And when you look at the controls on the amplifier, it's going to look something like you see here in the green box. Now, that's one of our amplifiers, but it might look like this somewhere else or like this on another one of our products. You'll see on there there's a, a little symbol HZ. That stands for hertz, hertz. And as we talked about earlier, that's related to frequency or cycles per second. So let's take a look at how these work. In the upper left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a representation of energy. This is energy from the signal source, your radio, that are going to go through those RCA cables to the amplifier. We often look at the line, but in reality, it's that whole shaded area. All that energy is going to go through and to your speakers. If you turn on an HP filter or a high-pass filter and set it to, let's say, in this case, 80 hertz, what will happen here is it's going to attenuate everything below that point so that it doesn't even bother getting amplified. So now your smaller speakers aren't being asked to play the lower frequencies that a subwoofer should normally play. Instead, the amplifier concentrates on the high frequencies only and passes those on. That's why we call it a high pass. It passes the high frequencies onto those other speakers. Now, this could be a really good way of protecting things. Now, you'll see the little arrows there. You can adjust those, the, the, the turn frequency below 80 hertz or above 80 hertz. And those are some adjustments you'll make depending on what speakers you're using in the vessel. And we will touch on that in just a moment. When the amp doesn't have to waste any energy on something that, it doesn't, that the speaker doesn't want to reproduce, it becomes more efficient overall, and that's a good thing. You saw that in the chart that Rob and I were just talking about. Now, this also works in reverse. You can use a low-pass filter and get rid of high frequencies that a big subwoofer just doesn't like to play. The difference here is that those high frequencies probably aren't going to hurt the subwoofer. It just doesn't sound particularly good, so why make it even uh, bother trying? Get rid of the highs for the bass. Get rid of the lows for the main speakers. Now, I mentioned that sometimes we call these things crossovers, but they're really filters. We use the term crossover because when you have a high pass and a low pass, they will cross over at some point, hence the name crossover. Some of the terms don't need explanation. That's a good example of one of them. So what happens if we don't do this right? Uh, well, one of the biggest benefits of a high pass filter is to stop the, the main speakers from moving too far. If they are asked to move too far, things can rip or tear or get stretched out and become what I call fatigue. They get tired. Think of the suspensions on a car. If you're always hitting bumps, eventually the suspensions will fail and the ride won't be as good. Well, the same thing's true of a speaker. If the suspensions get stretched out or fail, the sound's not going to be very good. So there are the failures that can happen with over excursion and things uh, related to the filter frequencies not being set right. But the main ones are rip or torn parts or just fatigue in general. There are ways of burning up a speaker. Now, this is one I think a lot of us have some experience with. Um, sending too much power through that coil of wire for too long of a period of time can cause the heat to build up, cause that thing to melt or you know, straight up burn. Sometimes if you don't set the input sensitivity properly, you can also cause these types of issues. But the most common one we've seen is when people buy the biggest amplifier they could possibly find and they put it on the cheapest speakers they could possibly find. 2,000 watts on a 25 watt speaker, you know what I'm talking about with a burned speaker. That's a good example of a recipe for disaster. But what I want to focus on is once you have the right amplifier and the right speakers is making sure the amplifier is doing the right thing in terms of input sensitivity or the level control. So input sensitivity, again, let's look at the controls on an amp. It looks like this. The input sensitivity is this area right here in the uh, orange shaded box. On some other product, it might look like this. Sometimes they call it gain or level. Uh, the proper term is actually input sensitivity because by definition, it takes any input 
and makes it more or less sensitive to that input signal. That signal could be either music or noise. In fact, it's almost always gonna be a bit of both. Ideally, you want more signal than you do noise, and that's where that term comes from, the signal to noise ratio. So what happens here is you'll take that small signal and you'll send that and a little bit of noise into the amplifier and you'll adjust the input sensitivity. And in this case, we turn it all the way down. And when we do that, the amplifier's job is to make it bigger. So not only does the signal get a little bit bigger, but the noise also gets a little bit bigger. But at that lowest setting, we're not really getting what the amp is intended to do. So we need to do more. So we're gonna turn that input sensitivity up a little bit more and you'll see that the output waveform has gotten larger, but so is the noise. Again, how sensitive are we to the input signal is what's coming out of the amplifier based on that input sensitivity. If we go all the way up to maximum, we'll see that we get the maximum waveform and also the maximum amount of noise. Now in a well-designed system, like the one Rob and I have been discussing with you, if the noise is low, it will get a little bit more. So if you ever get really, really close to a speaker when the input sensitivity is cranked all the way up, yes, the audio is really loud, but so is that noise. Ideally, you want a nice balance, not too much noise, lots of signal, without overdoing it. It is possible to overdo it, and let's talk about that now. Here again are those sine waves, and you're probably sick of seeing them. But as we, we go through, the sine wave is going from left to right. If we turn up the level and increase the amplitude, we talked about that earlier, you see the waveform is getting bigger and bigger and bigger still until at one point it may turn into what looks like a square wave. A square wave, if, if you look at the image that's on the screen right now, on the far left, you'll see that the sine wave is kind of rounded off, but in the middle, it's actually squared off. It's almost like we clipped off the top. And what a square wave is, it's pretty much, it's on all the way up and on all the way down. And this is very damaging or potentially damaging to both speakers as well as electrical systems, because this is asking for a lot more energy than a sine wave would. I think this is helpful to talk about what a square wave behavior might look like, but this next image I think is a better example of what happens with an audio system. On this chart, you'll see amplitude on the left and time going past as you go from left to right. The blue waveform is a sine wave that's getting larger. Think of this as you're turning up the input sensitivity, or think of this as you're turning up the volume control on a system that's already set. As we ask more and more from the amplifier, eventually it will run out, and it'll start to look like the blue waveform where it gets cut off. It wants to do what the red dotted line is doing. It wants to get that big, but it just can't. There's no more power. It looks like you've clipped off the top of the waveform. Hence the term clipping. Again, another term that describes itself. What happens here is that the waveform stays on at the top form and the bottom form. You see where it says almost square and it's pointing to that blue line? It's almost all on all the time. That amount of heat, that amount of current, that amount of energy can be very difficult for a speaker to reproduce and an electrical system to keep up with. Now this is a sine wave, but the same thing would happen to music. It'd just be a lot harder to look at because of the dynamic nature of it. But make no jokes about it. Clipping like this is what ultimately leads to most of the failures, both in electrical systems and in speakers themselves. So make sure we set these correctly. All right, so now what? We've kind of covered it all, so let's recap. Amplifiers need to be installed so that they don't break. Now this sounds really obvious, but we've seen images like this far, far too often. Now if you look at this, it looks like it's nice and neat. The wires are you know, kind of neat looking. It looks like they have drip loops until you realize that the batteries are in the bottom. The amplifiers are pointing straight up and all the wires are terminating directly into the amplifier. There are no drip loops here. All the water is going directly in. We see this so often that it's no longer obvious. So we want to ask you, please make sure when you're installing electronics in a vessel, you use drip loops and install them so the water runs off of the product, not into the product. Keep in mind, amplifiers need current more than most other items on the vessel. And as Rob and I were talking about earlier, you wanna make sure that you've addressed this with the proper amount of batteries, battery isolation, proper wiring, all of that needs to be taken care of. And we know that amplifiers need to be set up so that the input sensitivity is done correctly, keeping noise issues down and failures down as well. We also now know what filters do and how to set those up so that you get the most performance out of the speaker without failures. That's the goal here. So let's talk about actually setting it up. When you go to set it up, the easy stuff is setting high pass filters. Smaller speakers, they can't play much below 100 hertz, so that's a great place to start. Lower speakers can't really do it, so don't even ask them to. Now, if you have larger speakers, like uh, we make a 7.7 inch speaker called an M770, the M770 is bigger and can actually play lower, so you might be able to lower that frequency down to 90 hertz. 
But if you're really cool and you got our M880s, these are 8.8 inch speakers, those can play even lower. You might be able to sneak down to 80 hertz and still get good results. And you already know how to check. If you hear the fluttering, you've gone too far. Goose that back up and make sure that speaker's not moving too far. Another easy thing is current. Thicker wire, further away. Anytime you're far away and pulling a lot of current, a thicker wire is gonna be your friend. If you're not sure, go thicker. There are lots of charts and you can find them pretty much anywhere. The ABYC manual, the NMEA manual, they all will show you the recommended gauge wire for a given amount of current. And now we know how to estimate the uh, current draw from any amplifier that we trust. You know what I mean by that. If you see a, a tiny little amplifier that says it's 4,000 watts, don't trust that. But look at the fuse rating, look at the amplifier, determine what the real power could be, pick the pro proper wire and go from there. Now the hardest stuff is gonna be setting the input sensitivity because most of us don't have a way of looking at the signal to see when it's misbehaving. Fortunately, there are some easy ways of doing this and I'm gonna ask Kevin or Rob to put a link to our Help Center article on our website that actually goes through a process of setting level control on an amplifier. Now, of course, our amplifiers are very easy. We give you all this information in the owner's manual, but I realize that we're not the only company that makes amplifiers, so there are other ways. In fact, there's something that's known as a target voltage chart that will follow pretty much the same procedure that is in our owner's manual, but instead of looking for values that we provide, you'll have to look it up on a chart like this one. And I'll ask that the guys either provide a link to that or send me an email and I'll make sure I get that out to you. It's basic math using that Ohm's law thing that we skipped earlier um, as a way of determining what that target voltage. All you need is a multimeter and a sine wave test tone and you can set the level on any trustworthy amplifier and be done with it. So there you go. Okay. Time for my shameless plug. <laughs> so it should be clear that the people who are making our products, they get this stuff really, really well. And our entire range of products is really designed with all of this stuff in mind. Things like our source unit, cable, fuses, amplifier speakers, all of it. We get this stuff. We love this stuff. We love what we do and we design and put features into products that people like us, audio lovers, really, really get excited about. We like it. We hope you do too. <laughs> but I think what really makes JL Audio a special company is the fact that not only are we engineering, manufacturing, and supporting these products, we're doing most of this stuff in South Florida. We really love audio, and we love making this stuff, and hopefully you find a way to enjoy it with us. And with that, we'll jump onto our, our contact form, and we'll go through. If you need information, check out the, Marine, uh, the westmarinepro.com website. Go to electronics and navigation and find your way over to marine audio. There's a bunch of different categories like amplifiers, speakers, and so on. Um, you can look for it there. If you want detailed information about Dress JL Audio, of course, we recommend checking out our website. Um, if you need help with system design or troubleshooting, our tech support team is best in the business. They are fantastic. Um, technical at jlaudio.com. Or from our webpage, you can go to any one of the pages and there's a web form and you can contact us that way. If you have sales related questions, I got my man JT. JT is about the most enthusiastic and helpful guy you're gonna run into in this business. Use him like a tool. He's fantastic and he's very, very willing to help you. As are myself and all of our trainers, uh, you can contact us at training at jlaudio.com um, or however you need to. And with that, actually I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna leave the contact information up and we'll take whatever questions may have shown up in the chat. What do we got guys? So far, we're waiting for people to come in and give their questions. So please send us your questions either using the Q&A or the chat below. While we wait, I do want to once again thank West Marine Pro for giving us an opportunity. And everybody that's watching right now live, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. So obviously I get excited about this and uh, it's really a pleasure to share information like this with the people that understand and appreciate it. So thank you. Well, there have to be questions, but we <laughs> haven't gotten any yet. So please type away your questions while you've got all the experts here. So, well, well, while we're waiting again, uh, obviously there's a lot of technical content in there. And if I went too fast, I apologize, but I wanted to make sure that you got a good idea of what's going into uh, putting electronics on a boat when it comes to audio. One thing I didn't do is spend a lot of time talking about JL Audio products because I figured we have an opportunity now, if you had any of those questions, we could also field those. So again, open book here, whatever you guys want to ask, we're here for you. Uh, we'll stick around obviously for a while or until they kick us off, right? <laughs> 
Well, and you, you're going to make me a liar because I was telling Steve how great the questions have been throughout the <laughs> webinar series. So please, please send in your, your questions for Steve. We need the Jeopardy theme music, right? <laughs> Either that, Steve, or you were just so thorough that no one has any questions. I'm going with that. That's what I'm going to go with. <laughs> <laughs> I vote for that one, Steve. <laughs> so I was uh, watching some of the other sessions, and one of the gentlemen had pointed out that when he was, uh, he was doing the battery charging one, and he pointed out at the beginning that this is a 25 or 30 minute session, and normally he does a three hour session. And that's sort of how I felt. Uh, our, our team, we actually do very lengthy presentations where we get into all the details of every one of these things. And actually filtering it down to something that we can condense into a 30 minute session or so is a challenge. Um, so we, we did anticipate questions knowing that we had a lot of content to pack into a tight little area. The reason for sharing that is, you know, we are willing to share all of that information as time allows. And if you have some time for us either now or in the future, just ping us. You know, again, we, we kind of see all of you as partners of ours and we want to help our partners do well. Oh, we've got one. Yes. Here we go. <laughs> okay, what do we got? <laughs> uh, can you discuss some of the head units that JL offers with remote at the helm? Okay, um, I'll talk a little bit about this, but I am going to defer to JT because I think he knows the product mix on that level um, a little bit better overall. But we have the MM40, which is, uh, uh, sorry, the MM50, I'm thinking of the remote. The, uh, the MM50, which is a um, powered radio that has a small built-in amplifier and it has zone, zone support. Um, the premier one is our MM100SBE, I think is the official name. We, we use the slang internally. Um, and that one does not have an amplifier that will need external amplifiers to, to make it work. In terms of the remote at the helm, both of those can connect to a NEMA network. So if you're using an MFD and have a NEMA network that's compatible with our system, which is most of them, you'll be able to get some of that control directly on your MFD. If not, we do have a number of different remotes, including a small hockey puck style remote that you could mount at the helm to has uh, basic controls over the source unit. We also have the MM40R, which is a display remote that will give you more visibility and additional control over the system. And I think, Todd, do we still have the key fob? Uh, we are in transition in models right now, but we do typically have a wireless solution for volume and basic control. Gotcha. There you go. That's why I needed you, JT. Thank you. Did that answer the question well enough? Uh, Phil, if you want to type an answer to that, if we answered your question properly, that would be great. Any other questions while you're on the uh, webinar, folks? Oh, here we go. Yes, it did. He, um, he asked, uh, will any of these units integrate with a Garmin head unit? Um, with a Garmin head unit or a Garmin MFD? I would think an MFD. So the answer is yes. Obviously, the uh, NEMA protocol does allow for um, audio controls. It does not actually carry the audio, but the audio controls. And most of the significant vendors that are making MFDs have acknowledged JL Audio products on their network as well. And Garmin is definitely one of those. Now, what functions show up is truly up to them. Um, I, I like to call this as that we're broadcasting control options. And whether they actually take advantage of that, there's only so much we can do. Fortunately, most of them have decided to give a lot of flexibility and control to the user. So the answer to on a NEMA network, yes, those Garmin should work just fine. In terms of our remotes working with other uh, manufacturer source units, unfortunately, that's not the case. JL Audio stuff will play nice with JL Audio and JL Audio NEMA compatible products will play nice with anything that will play nice with us on the network as well. And then another question, does having the RBG lights integrated affect the performance of the speaker sound due to the power used or, or the construction of the speaker? That's, That's a, a fantastic question. question. You got that, Rob? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, especially the, the way, first of all, it has no impact on the performance of the speaker in terms of uh, how it sounds. Um, the, the power for the LEDs is coming from a separate source, so we're not losing any of the AC voltage from the amplifier to the speaker. So we're not going to have any compromise in terms of the performance. Um, in terms of construction, it really depends on how you do it. On our, on our M6 line of speakers, 
Um, the RGBs LEDs are actually, they, they line the entire top frame of the speaker and illuminate from behind. So by doing that, they're on the most sturdy part of the speaker assembly by being attached to the top of the frame. On our M3 models, they're actually integrated into the backside of the grill on the Sport Grill M3s and surround the tweeter. And again, they're completely encased, they're protected, and there's nothing that would have any negative impact in terms of the speaker's reliability, the construction, nothing different than if it was a non-LED model. Um, if done right, you'll, you should see no physical uh, changes or impact and sonically hear any um, uh, impact to the music on the vessel. Well, I might add, Rob, is um, sometimes uh, the RGB lighting has the potential to inject noise into the system, and that, of course, would be a detriment overall. So depending on how that's all wired in, you know, just be mindful of the noise. That's that signal the noise thing that we talked about. And how minimal is that power draw on, uh, on RGB lights in general? Is it similar to an LED where it's a very small amp draw anyway? Uh, it really depends on the speakers. Um, our M6 line, being that we being we line the entire top frame of the speaker, there are considerably more LEDs than just about any other RGB speaker on the market. Our M3s, for example, use four to five LEDs, which is pretty common amongst uh, you know all RGB marine speakers. But our M6 models range anywhere from 20 up to 36 or 38 LEDs. So an M712 subwoofer um, can pull almost an amp of current, uh, or no, um, half, I've heard correctly half an amp of current because we have all, you know so many LEDs on it. So a more traditional line, uh, it's very minimal. Um, really where you need, to, it really matters mostly with RGBs and current draw is when you get into the RGB controllers, especially with the M6 speakers that we carry because they do draw significantly more current than other speakers. So just make sure with an RGB controller, you have one that can handle a good amount of current if you're using it with our M6 products. And I know we're, we need to close, it's been a long session, but just for those that aren't familiar, if you look at JT Wilson there, the image behind him is the M6 speakers that Rob's been talking about, and the illumination colors that are shown there, th those are not renderings, those are actual images of how that intensity is. And that's because of the number of, um, RGB LEDs that Rob was just describing. So there is a reward for that <laughs> um, going to the M6 level product. It's a gorgeous looking product and I strongly recommend taking a look at that if you're interested in some cool speakers. They also sound utterly fantastic. And they don't just look good, they sound better than anything we've done before. So. Well, thank you to everyone from JL Audio and to West Marine Pro and to all of you. We wish you all a very happy, healthy and peaceful Fourth of July holiday. Absolutely. And um, again, the contact information for JL is here. And with that said, I think that's the end of our webinar today. Great. Thank you all very much for being here. Bye. Thank you. Take care.